Live to see it, friends, and welcome to the world transformed. This program is your guide to an astounding future that lies ahead, one that will be here sooner than you think, and one that you have an important role to play in bringing about. At the world transformed, we want to introduce you to what may be the greatest transformation of them all, the one that begins with considering and acting on the almost limitless possibilities that lie before us and that ends somewhere beyond the reach of the human imagination. So, when does this amazing future begin? Well, today is the day. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and I am flying solo here in the virtual studio this evening with a very special show, a very special interview, and a very special guest. We are delighted to welcome John Myers to the World Transform this evening. John has nearly 20 years of experience in areas related to business analytics and business intelligence in professional services, sales, consulting, product management, industry analysis, and research. He has helped organizations to solve their analytics problems, whether they're related to operational platforms such as customer care or billing, applied analytical applications such as revenue assurance or fraud management. He's established thought leadership in emerging data management paradigms such as big data, which is a combination of multi-structured and relational data sets, as we'll be getting into a little bit later, and applications and NoSQL access data stores. John's a frequent contributor to industry publications including Search Business Analytics, Inside Analysis, and Information Management. He speaks internationally on the topics of telecom analytics, data virtualization, and big data. John's also considered one of the top 100 big data influencers. He's a Managing Research Director of Business Intelligence and Analytics Practice with EMA. John, welcome to the World Transformed. Well, thank you very much, Phil. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you on. You know, we've known each other for a long time, and finally got around to having you on the show, so I feel I feel like just another one off the bucket list there, pretty much. Uh, well, you know. I, I, like I said, I'm honored to be here, and I, I've been looking forward to it. Well, great. You know, we did a show last week. I've got this new book out, Engines of Disruption, talking about how data impacts everything, and I thought it'd be fun to dip into... Uh, we, we, Stephen and I talked last week a little bit about what big data is and how it's having this impact across industries and really across all of society when you look at it, kind of redefining how a lot of things are done and expectations about how things are going to happen in the future. I thought it would be a great idea to spend some time talking about what that future looks like. And one of the things that I want to get into is the future of a technology called Hadoop. We talked about that a little bit last week, but it might be good just for the standpoint of refreshing the audience, those who, who didn't catch last week's show. Can you give us a quick, what is Hadoop? Why is it important? And then we can get into what the future of it might be. Well, what is Hadoop is a, is a, is a wide and many... That's uh, a loaded question, isn't it? It I, is. I, it is. I'm, glad I, I'm glad I gave you that one, actually. Yeah, just about everybody has their own uh, thought processes on exactly what is Hadoop. I like to think of Hadoop as being an ecosystem of interrelated uh, technology, open source technology projects. Um, Hadoop was originally created um, as a as a massively parallel storage and processing uh, platform, uh, and that's you know what we oftentimes when we think of the little yellow elephant, uh, that was the original project uh, from the from the point of view of, of the research that I've had. And Hadoop ecosystems have grown and expanded since then. You know we've got. Uh, concepts such as um, uh, different storage formats within the HDFS. We got uh, different processing engines. We originally started out with MapReduce. We moved on to what you might call MapReduce 2 or Yarn. We've seen improvements in that. Lately, we've seen uh, a whole new processing engine called Spark that can work on the Hadoop platform, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, We've seen people do SQL on Hadoop. We've seen people do... uh, uh, control and process management on Hadoop, you know, all these different types of things. But at its core, when I describe Hadoop to people, it's a open source uh, set of projects uh, that are managed by the Apache Foundation, and they get m- contributions from many different groups, and they build this up. Now, one of the unique things, like, in my opinion, about Hadoop is that if we look back to uh, other Apache projects like um, Linux, we right. always had the requirements pre-built, if that makes sense, because Linus Torvalds basically said, hey, you know, for, I think it was a a graduate project, he was going to make a free version of Unix, and that became Linux. Well, Hadoop didn't necessarily have 
all of the requirements written in advance and people were just doing it from an open source perspective. This is a large groups of people who were saying, hey, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do all these different types of things, and they all came together, and you know, these projects are managed by um, the Apache Foundation. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting that we oftentimes see there is a open source version of a Hadoop or an Apache project, and then right. there might be a commercial version of it as well. So you'll see a lot of organizations that are fundamentally commercial organizations that are donating code, time, and intellectual property into the Apache Foundation. And in the Hadoop world, it's these committers, right? That's what mm -hmm. the, uh, the the term is called, these developers who are uh, committing code into into the whole Hadoop infrastructure. So if you if you wind it back to what it started as, you've got these these two basic pieces. The uh, you, you mentioned the HDFS, the, the, this file structure, mm -hmm. and MapReduce. These these two technologies that I, I think both were developed at Google, right? Um, I'm trying right? to remember exactly who the the main committers are, but there were great work that were done by Yahoo, Google, Facebook, etc. Yeah. So there, there's been been being there's been big contributions uh, across the board to it. Um, but those, those two technologies initially were kind of the foundation of Hadoop, and it was all around um, handling large quantities of data, big, big data sets, diverse data sets. So you had this file structure rather than kind of a traditional database structure, and you had this, uh, this, this way of scaling out large data sets and, and having some access to them that previously was unavailable. And then from there, everything else you just described has, has kind of grown onto it. It's grown from uh, kind of this basic set of value propositions into this, this whole ecosystem of solutions to the point where it's really almost, well, going back to your, your initial, let me wind into this answer, it's kind of hard to say what Hadoop is, isn't it? Well, I mean, like I said, it, it, it depends on what perspective you come from, but yes, it's, it's, it, it's difficult to see where it all comes together. But based on everything you said, it sounds like there's a lot of people doing a lot of things with it. We know there are a lot of businesses who have turned to it. And what I've seen in the media lately is a discussion about whether it's working out, whether this whole Hadoop thing turns out to be a good idea or not. And I'll draw your attention to this article that I'm linking in the show notes was over on uh, Datanami just a few weeks ago, and the headline was, Hadoop has failed us, tech experts say. And you, and you hear a lot of this kind of stuff, but this one got a lot of attention. I saw it all over social media and, and a, lot of this, a lot of discussion around it, basically saying, we tried it, it hasn't worked out, it's, uh, it, it, basically it's too complex, uh, and businesses are turning to other solutions. What do you make of that? analysis as, as someone who's kind of looking at big data all the time. Is, is, does that uh, resonate with what you're seeing? Well, I think it depends on what you're attempting to do with your Hadoop ecosystem. depends on whether you've been successful with it or not. Um, as I pointed out, a lot of the times when we saw people developing uh, Apache projects for Hadoop or based in, on Hadoop infrastructure, things of that nature, they would not necessarily be replicating existing requirements. They'd be building out new requirements. So the right. handling of multi-structured data, which is um, something I think uh, that Hadoop is uniquely uh, you know, positioned to do, things like XML uh, documents, JSON documents, et cetera, they don't fit very well in a relational database because they have a variable structure that goes along with them. So... They fit very nicely into the HDFS and, you know, the, the MapReduce yarn and other processing engines can chug along on them and do all those types of things. So, you know, I think that's, you've got to ask yourself, what is it trying to do? Or what are you going to ask your Hadoop infrastructure ecosystem to do for you? Um, but if I'm going to try to replace an existing relational database or relational database application like a data mart or an enterprise data warehouse and just do it on top of the existing, say, HDFS, Hive, MapReduce types of things, you're going to run into some problems and some, some issues that go along with that. Because as these things are being built out and people are saying, hey, we want to put these 
concepts into production in our data center, people are learning that all of those requirements that they might have said, hey, we don't need this, and that might have been security that got thrown out. We don't need this, and that might have been high availability gets thrown out. Right. And we try to go into a production environment, and the production guys go, where's your security model so that we don't expose ourselves? Where's your high availability model in case we have a node fall down, things of that nature? They're having to go back and take a look at those concepts and reevaluate them. So it's something that I think that when people go, it, it, it has failed us, my first question would be, what did you ask it to do? Right. And if you were <coughs> intending your Hadoop Hive implementation to replace completely something that's powering, and I'll just pick something off the top of my head, um, my uh, financial reporting uh, stack, well, that's not going to work because the SQL queries associated with most financial reporting stacks have been built up over time and SQL 92, SQL 99, SQL 2003, and some of those components that exist within those SQL compliance pieces, they don't match up with what an HDFS file system or a Hive or some of the, the newer types of uh, Hadoop ecosystem components were going to bring to the table. So if you say, hey, I want it to replace my enterprise data warehouse or I want it to replace my billing platform, yeah, it's going to fail um, because it's not really designed to meet that particular component or that particular mission as of yet. Yeah, I think uh, w one of the things that I wonder about is whether Hadoop's shelf life has expired or whether the you know some of the hype has maybe uh, hit its shelf life, right? Maybe it's it's uh, reached its expiration date because what I see happening, or you know, a couple of scenarios I would throw at you here that that might reflect what's going on. One would be an organization thinks they're buying a product when in fact they're buying an enabling technology for a solution. That's going to cause all kinds of disconnects. Anytime you do that, anytime you buy what is essentially a kit <laughs> when you think you've bought a thing, right? Those right. are two, those, those those are two different things and it and it leads to no end of trouble for the people who do it. You hear that Hadoop is going to solve your uh, we've got all these different kinds of data problem, and it does. It's going to solve our, we've got a massively scale to these large data sets problem, and it will do that. The, the problem is there were all these other problems that were solved previously using other technologies, using existing database and data warehousing technologies that you're not thinking about because your pain right now is with, is with those two areas. So you think, well, we'll just go in and, and we'll get Hadoop, and it solves those those pains we're having, and then you, once you're up and running, to your point, security or you know, what if you needed the lineage of the data, right? Mm -hmm. all, all of these, all of these different features that have been built into database systems and data warehousing solutions for a long time aren't necessarily out of the box with Hadoop. They're not necessarily just going to show up with Hadoop. You have to have people on staff to make those things happen. You have, you know, you have to know where to find them. And I think maybe it's it's probably that disconnect more than anything else that that is leading to this this kind of analysis. I you know I, I have two analogies that I've used around um, big data and NoSQL and things of that nature. Um, the first one is that when people think of the Apache Software Foundation and the licensing that goes along with that, they think about free. They think I've downloaded right. and I'm all yeah. set to go, et cetera. And I usually talk about this in in terms of there's free, like free beer at a fraternity house. You walk in, you get free beer, you're all set to go. There's free speech. Where, which is one of the best things, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we can agree, yes. Free beer. There's free speech, which, as most people know, you you know, in, in, in the United States, you can say pretty much anything you want, but you are held accountable for what you say. Right. Hadoop is free like a free puppy. Yes, you can pick up a free puppy at the store or the park or the whatever, but after you've picked up this free puppy, you are responsible for walking it, feeding it, uh, getting it at shots, training it, doing all these types of things. So The damage it does to the neighbor's yard, the whole thing, right? I mean, pretty much, yeah. yeah. So I like to think about it in terms of that. So like, like you said, a lot of, you know, one of the great things that I think Hadoop has done has, has changed a significantly, if not fundamentally, the cost structure of data storage and data management 
that we've seen in IT. And it has done so partly because of Apache. Part of it is because of uh, the commodity hardware model that it uses. You know, there's a lot of factors that go into that. But it's by no means free. <laughs> you know, like I said, you've got to walk it, you've got to feed it, you've got to get its shots, all that kind of fun stuff. The other analogy that I like to use kind of goes back to that that concept that the open source community in this in these cases weren't replicating of an existing project they were, or product. They were trying to think about something new that they could do, something exciting, something that wasn't meeting their needs. And to a certain extent, at the time that uh, uh, Hadoop and some of the other NoSQL projects came into being, there was a lack of innovation in our data management space. And for the most part, we kind of fell down to a couple of major uh, relational database uh, vendors and, you know, getting changes into whether it be the query engines or the, the processing models or things of that nature was starting to become difficult. And there's a lot of these, you know, quote unquote kids who came in and said, you know what, I want to do something completely different. I don't want my, you know, my father's Oldsmobile with all of the bells and whistles. Really, all I want is a Volkswagen bug dune buggy that I can bomb around in the desert with, you know, big, huge, high muffler, roll cage, blah, blah. Right. Well, then they decided, hey, I want to drive it home. <laughs> and the sheriff was met him at the, at the, on the county road and said, boys, no, no, no. We can't do that. we got to have real tires, real brakes, real seat belts, blah, blah, blah. And soon all of these projects kind of realized all that stuff that they had fought against by saying, hey, why do I need this, something that is included in all these other major data management platforms, things of that nature, they're kind of, again, they're trying to go, they're kind of going, hey, I guess that's something we need to have. And like I said, security is the one that really bubbles to the top of my mind. And then some of those monitoring and management components that go along to say, hey, are we up and running? How do we have a graceful um, recovery from errors, things of that nature? And we're starting to see that. Hadoop has been around for, I believe now is its 11th birthday. Um, I was actually honored enough to be at Hadoop's 10th birthday last year, so that would make it the 11th birthday this year. Uh, um, yeah. If you think about relational databases, they've been around for 40-plus years. Right, right. So if we're going to say that Hadoop has failed us, uh, because maybe perhaps somebody has set expectations way too high, um, then yes, we can say that. If we're saying that Hadoop and its ecosystem are growing into, you know, their 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 feet or their legs or whatever you want to call it, um, at a rapid pace, at 10 years old or 11 years old, the relational database market was not even close to what we're seeing today in terms of power, potential, usage, things of that nature. So I'm not saying let's give them a break because they're kids, but hey, let's give them a break because they're, they're kids. kids. Yeah, I think that's that's perfectly fair. And can can you can you take that one step further? What do you see as the future for Hadoop? It's kind of hard to predict the future these days. I'll grant you. So I'm I'm not I'm not going to ask you you know anything that you're going to commit to or you know <laughs> that you have to pay us back if you get it wrong. But uh, you know we've been talking about Hadoop for ten years. You think ten years from now we'll be talking about Hadoop? Will it still have a central role? Um, will other technologies have replaced it? Uh, wh where do you see big data going in, in terms of the technology okay. that supports it? Well, uh, in terms of Hadoop, um, I'm going to take a page uh, from the guys over at Cloudera. Um, and they have said uh, to the wider analyst community, um, at, and I believe at, their, um, at the Strata San Jose shows uh, the last two years, they really see a world where the, the concept of Hadoop is not front and center. Hmm. They see a world where the applications, where the data are front and center and how you handle that. Uh, for the most part, we don't necessarily think of the operating system or the storage layer that goes along with some of the things that we do as being the important part. We think about the things that run on those as being the important part. So, I, you know, in 10 years' time, Hadoop will still be here. It'll still be with us, but we'll be talking more about the applications and the business uses, uses that that technology enables, not the technology itself, if that makes right. sense. Right. Yeah. So the, the, the name Hadoop 
you know, it'll, it'll, it'll still be there. We'll still be talking about uh, these pieces. Well, in the same way you think about it, we're still talking about databases, and they still make up a huge piece of what's going on. Um, actually, that's probably not a good analogy, because databases are still very central in a way that maybe Hadoop won't be. Uh, depending on de depending on what comes down the pipe between now and then. What's interesting is new things keep showing up too, right? It's not like Hadoop was the was the last thing to be introduced. As you as you point out, a whole ecosystem has grown up around that, and some of those technologies have kind of come into their own right. To part of what makes it hard to define what Hadoop is is the fact that s some of the technologies that initially looked like they were going to support Hadoop almost replace it in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. or, or or do things that uh, that Hadoop we thought Hadoop was going to do, and we, we ended up doing them with, you know, Spark or uh, with Kafka. Or, you know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities out there. And I think that speaks to the fact that we're just kind of in the early days of big data, if, if big data is even a good term to use to describe that. But do you have any comments to make about where the data world is going generally? What do you, what do you expect to see in terms of the impact that data is having on our lives generally and on how business is done and what what occurs in the world overall. Well, you know, what's what's the future of data, not just Hadoop? Well, I, I think that, it, it, you know, when we look at the wonderful world of big data, it's, it's always helpful to look at kind of what's the difference between, say, the generation or the era of big data versus the previous era. Right. And in my opinion, the, the previous era was focused on things that were within our four walls of our data center, and basically fit within the box of the relational uh, database structure. Um, right. If you were to look at, say, the call detail records associated with um, any of the major uh, mobile telecoms in the world, you would be bordering on the wonderful world of big data, and those concepts were really stretching and pressing on the relational database structures, you know, whether it be from uh, capacity, processing, things of that nature. Um, in the big data era, we are going to see even more of that type of data because we're starting to get into the concept of information from mobile devices, not just call detail records, but um, mobile application information, uh, apps that are running there on those platforms, things of that nature. We start to get into um, the monitoring and management of data that comes from our online applications. A lot of people call this web log analysis and things of that nature, clickstream analysis. We're also starting to move into the area of social media and social engagement, and then we start to get into the wonderful world of IoT and connected devices. And each time we do that, we start getting into this, you know, this kind of exponentially larger group of data that's coming through. And a lot of it is, you know, to borrow a term uh, from Nate Silver um, over at 538, um, you know, a lot of it is noise. Right. You know, right. it's just, you know, blah, blah. Well, but particular groups are going to get the signal that they need to get the good business value that they want out of it. And we're going to see that in, in, in included more and more into our daily lives, into our applications, things of that nature. I'll give you two examples that I think kind of encapsulate it. Um, in terms of signal versus noise, there was a point in time in the telecommunications industry where nobody cared about the network quality of mobile calls. You know, right. it's like, hey, whatever, you know, marketing's like, yeah, what, the network's... <laughs> hey, we completed the call. Yeah, you know, exactly. what do you want? Yeah. And then somebody started doing analysis on people that were uh, churning away from major carriers, and they started looking at it and go, why, were, why are these people churning? And they said, can we take a look at the network quality? And they started noticing that people who churned were people who had um, bad connections, drop calls, things of that nature. And then suddenly the light went on, click. The marketing guys went, oh, my God. If the calls get dropped, people drop us. Right. And it's, it's kind of something about the network guys are kind of sitting over there in the corner going, you just figured this out. <laughs> and so now we expanded into rather than just the, the monetary value of these calls, we started to get into the quality aspects of these calls. And it was this kind of sea change where people started saying, hey, we need to be mindful of what happens and things of that nature. You know, you and I both living in the state of Colorado, we know that cell phones were developed in Kansas City 
because they don't work when you go behind a hill or a large piece of rock or things of that right. nature. Um, the other one is if you look at the ride sharing applications that are out there, if you'd asked me five years ago, I never would have uh, thought that you could, would, or should flip over the quote unquote taxi industry. It's regulated, it's run by people who defend their turf to the death, etc. But what they had was a bad customer experience model where it was like, if you called for a cab, well, in 30 to 40 minutes, somebody may or may not be there. Right. You don't know how much your, your, your ride is going to cost. You don't know where you've been on your ride, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Then along comes Lyft and Uber, Fasten, and some of the other groups, and they were like, there's GPS information on most smartphones. Let's enable the smartphone-carrying public and smartphone-enabled uh, drivers who want to share will create a model where we can take that very precise GPS information and tell the customer, hey, your ride will be here in like, you know, three to five minutes, eight minutes. You can actually, right. you, know, you know, I think the other day I was bored and I watched my driver all the way in to pick me up. On the other side of that is now we've got a very fine-grained GPS record of where the ride went what your rating, uh, what your costs were for tolls, mileage, time, etc., and you can look at that on your receipt online. And now you know, hey, if I need to dispute something, I've got the information I need to do it. If you're looking for an experience perspective, you're no longer maybe kind of sorta. You know the rating of your driver. You know when they're going to be arriving. You have an estimate on what the cost of the ride is going to be, and it's all handled. Uh, through uh, a, a payment engine. And now you've got this big data concept where we're taking multi-structured uh, GPS data and we're linking it together and we're saying, hey, we can have a fundamentally different experience than the one that we had before. Now we're starting to see another change in the world if you look at autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, etc. At the moment, we kind of operate on a you know, I own my car method. Right. Now let's imagine we get to an autonomous one and we say, all right, I'm now going to own a share of a vehicle. And when I want that, I hit my app and the autonomous vehicle comes to me, picks me up, drives me where I'm supposed to go, and then it goes and shares with somebody else. I don't physically own a vehicle anymore. I own a subset of it and or I go to a self-driving, you know, rideshare application. But there would be another thing where we're fundamentally flipping over the ownership of vehicles, et cetera, all because we've got the data that comes from these vehicles and we can now make that a reality. Yeah, we talk, we talk on this show, we talk a lot about a uh, term that uh, R. Buckminster Fuller used, ephemeralization, this idea of doing more and more with less and less and just data kind of eating everything mm -hmm. is, 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 is kind of the analogy. It, you know, it's, it's eating, it's eating whole uh, industries, and you see it just replacing things. You know, we've got data in place of things that that we used to have. Uh, there's still a car picking you up when you when you get a taxi, but the whole taxi, or excuse me, when you get an Uber or or a Lyft, but the whole taxi infrastructure is is missing. Right, that 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 whole paradigm is gone now. Well, uh, I wouldn't say it's gone. I'd say it has been chopped up into small pieces and handed out. Yeah, um, exactly. Because the cars still exist, the drivers still exist, the payment engine still exists. It's just kind of in the, you know, if you will, in the cloud or little bits of share uh, components that go along with that. The way you describe it, and I'm not saying no to the way you were describing how data is doing some of these things and certain components are starting to disappear, but I also think that there's great value in what data is able to give to us. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there, you know, with the information that we have, we can do things that we never thought that we could do before. I think that one example would be um, remote biomedical sensing. Um, I have what is not considered a medical grade um, heart monitor uh, provided to me by, the, by a company that does uh, running equipment. Um, but I can now track my heart rate, and I would dare say that the you know the website that I aggregate my exercises onto knows more about my physical condition 
than even my myself or my physician does. Right. And right. before that, you know, if you wanted to track your heart rate and your GPS and all these different things, you had to go to a lab or you had to do this or you had to do that. And now I can put on a chest strap and slap my charged up watch on my wrist and I'm off and running in my, you know, East Boulder County having a good time with it. And that level of freedom allows me to track my activities and my exercise and things of that nature much closely, much more closely than I would before. And it allows me to do things like that before. I think the Nest thermostats are another one. People didn't used to have the ability unless they wanted to spend all their time futzing with their, their thermostat. They can now, you know, say, hey, let's set some parameters that are flexible and, uh, if you will, adjustable and make that a reality and say, hey, we're going to lower our carbon footprint. We're going to lower the cost of heating and cooling our home and have a great experience while we're doing it. That's amazing. I mean, you, you think about all the different areas of our lives that can now be touched by data in a way that we just wouldn't have even thought about. Hmm. Even a couple of years ago, even a couple, a couple three years ago, and I was, I was thinking about what you said about just the, the the sheer volume that we deal with. I think that's kind of the reality going forward. One one thing we have to get used to is just the fact that there's a lot of data. Hmm. And I, when I look at when I look at big data, I look at this other kind of technology that's growing up alongside it, machine learning, which is predicated on the fact that there's these huge volumes of data and that there's there's good insights to be taken out of that data. Um, that we wouldn't have had before. There's, there's, there's kind of a similar thing there. I think it, it's almost like the ocean. You know, do you, do you really need to worry about signal to noise? You don't think about, you don't think about filtering the ocean down. You know, maybe what you want out of the ocean is just to see a few coral, but you need the whole ocean to go in and see the few coral, right? Or you, you just want to catch a few shrimp, but the ocean has to be there in order to, get, <laughs> right? In order to yep. get those, in order to get those few shrimp. I, I think we're, we're gonna, we're gonna view data just as kind of this sea that we're that we're swimming in pretty well, much yeah no I, and I i agree wholeheartedly and there's there's a couple of ways to look at it and you can say hey i just want the signal that applies to me today yeah and in your analogy that would be that's like okay here's an aquarium yeah you know, or here's a fish tank <laughs> yeah you know, I've, I've got my little bit of the signal and i'm all i'm all good um, but there's so many no more things that you can discover, you can explore, you can find these different relationships. And I think that's where the ocean analogy comes in. And a certain amount of what we can do with machine learning, we can do with a certain amount of cognitive computing and other advanced platforms, is that there's always something out there where we're asking that next question. You know, kind of like my telecom example about, you know, network quality, measurements in association with customer churn. There's all these connections that are out there, and a lot of times it takes that person that has that moment of ingenuity or that moment of curiosity and goes, are these things linked? Well, if they were in, say, maybe not inside of that signal definition, they may have been thrown out. And I think that previously um, with our traditional um, and I'll start getting geeky here, SMP uh, relational databases with very fixed data models, if it didn't fit within the signal side, we would literally chop it off and throw it away. Not right. chop it off and save it. You had no choice, right? I mean, Exactly. That, yeah. Because disk was expensive, storage was expensive, all that kind of fun stuff. Now I'm not saying that it's free, but it is relatively inexpensive, and we can have the whole ocean and we can kind of explore those relationships because of things like Hadoop, NoSQL, and the way that it's changed that cost curve. And now we can store that data. We can pull in all of this information and say, you know what, it's very strange, but, you know, there's something, you know, some analyst goes, I think there's a relationship between these two. Let me see if I can make that <coughs> as a positive either, um, you know, very strong correlation or, you know, whatever we want to call that, but make bring that together and say, hey, these things are linked and I can prove it or I feel good about it and now you, I can start acting on it. But if it wasn't available to you, you can do those types of things, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And when you think about all those different potential relationships and all the potential insights, I mean, the possibilities are, if not endless, they're just very broad. 
broader than, than than we could possibly imagine. I think. Well, I, some of the things that we've always said when we look back with our hindsight is 2020 concept is, you know, it was a failure of an imagination, or yeah. perhaps maybe it was a failure of a lack of data to look at those particular things as they come together. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of. I don't know if you read Michael Lewis's books, you know, uh, The Big Short, Moneyball, et cetera. Oh, sure, yeah. In The Big Short, one of the key things that he says is all of that data was there. Right. He just had to go look at it and say, this is the problem. <laughs> and a few people did because they had done some heroic level of, if you will, data mining or data exploration or whatever you want to call it, and they found it. But now with things like Hadoop and machine learning, that is now available to, well, people who can do it, but, you know, it's now it's not a limiting factor that it's one or two people. It's whoever has access to the data and has that imagination to go looking for it. And so for all of us, the, the possibilities unfold and uh, maybe no longer limited by our imagination because we're going to be able to imagine more than we could. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, John, I can't tell you how great it is having you on and talking with you about these things. The time flew by, and uh, we've actually gone a little longer than, than we intended, but uh, I couldn't stop, for one, so um, I don't know about you. Uh, tell you what, uh, let's, uh, let's have you back on again another time. I'd love to uh, discuss these things a little bit further. That'd be great. I'd love to, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. And um, like I said, the, as you pointed out, the, 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 the possibilities may not be, you know, Strictly endless, but they are broad and ever-growing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Okay, so that's going to do it for this edition of The World Transformed. We will be back again tomorrow with a dip into the archives and the best of The World Transformed. And then we'll be back again on Wednesday with an all-new show. Stephen will be back. And we'll be talking once again to our good friend, futurist Thomas Frey. You will not want to miss that. Look forward to being with you all then. And until next time, live to see it.